Well, I'm delighted uh, that I was um, invited to this um, glorious institution here. Thanks a lot, and thanks for coming. Uh, this is a talk about the sentence, Socrates is courageous, as it were. Um, and if you look at the handout there, you'll find all these uh, examples I will be hunting. Uh, and you can see how the uh, uh, talk is, uh, which part, parts the talk has. Um, I will go on for a dreadfully long time. I hope you won't suffer from that. Uh, please bear with me. Section 1, Resurrection of the Copia. Let me read out this quotation you see uh, behind me. Dear Russell, I believe that our problems can be traced down to the atomic propositions. This you will see if you try to explain precisely in what way the copula in such a proposition has meaning. I therefore now think about Socrates is human, good old Socrates, yours most, etc., etc., Ludwig Wittgenstein. Doing what Wittgenstein did in summer 1912 won't do us any harm, I think. So let us brood upon the structure of elementary predications. The declarative sentence on the handout E, Socrates is courageous, E for elementary predication, consists, as philosophers have known for a long time, haven't they, of a singular term, the name of good old Socrates, and a predicate, full stop. Well, it's not for such a long time that philosophers know this. Before Frege, they have kept on saying for many centuries that sentences like E consist of three components, a subject, a copula, and a predicate. Obviously, predicate is used differently in these descriptions of sentential structure. You extract a predicate from a sentence that contains at least one name, singular term, by deleting at least one name occurrence. Thus understood, predicates are, as it were, name-hungry, and their hunger is satisfied by throwing a name into their jaws. Frege and predicates are sentence-forming operators on singular terms, and the copula is, is just part of some of these operators. Notice that this is a far cry from the claim, upheld by at least one important post-Fregean philosopher, that the word is occurs in a predicate in the same way as its echo occurs in the word Islamic, as a fragment of a semantically seamless whole. In order to avoid terminological confusion, I shall shun the old use of the word predicate. How then are we to classify the adjective in E? Well, traditional logic provides us with another title for what follows the copula, general term. The copula, we can now say, is an operator which takes general terms as input and delivers predicates as output. Even within the realm of elementary predications, the general term may very well be more complex. In Socrates is a man, it is a phrase consisting of an indefinite article and a noun. Furthermore, as we all know, not all elementary predications contain the copula in the shape of a word like is. After all, when Plato reflected for the first time on the structure of elementary predications, his paradigm was Theotetus sits. But very soon afterwards, his greatest pupil tried to uncover a copula even in sentences like Theotetus sits or epsilon on the handout, Socrates walks. I'm alluding to Aristotle's notorious constructio periphrastica. Here's a quotation from the interpretation. It makes no difference whether we say uh, of a man that he walks, but did I, or whether we say that he is walking. We better forget about the English progressive aspect in this context. The authors of the Port Royal logic and the great grandfather of analytical philosophy have followed Aristotle's footsteps in this respect. Antoine Arnaud and Pierre Nicole write, c'est la même chose de dire Pierre vit que dire Pierre est vivant and you find um, exactly the same message in Bolzano's Wissenschaftslehre. But one may very well wonder whether the construction is plus participle really has the same sense as the finite form of the full verb. And in any case, it would be fine if we could avoid such linguistic contortions. Consider a variant of epsilon. Socrates does walk. Here the word does plays the same role as the word is in E. It transforms the Socrates-free fragment of the sentence into a sentence. 
The only difference between Epsilon and this variant, Socrates does walk, is that in Epsilon the job is not done by a word, but only by the verb ending. In an expanded sense of copula, we might as well say that in Epsilon, in epsilon the verb ending is the copula. Frege, not exactly famous for being a friend of the copula, saw this quite clearly. He wrote in, this, in his 1892 paper uh, on concept and object. Often the word is serves as a um, copula, as a mere form word of the Aussage. I will soon explain why I leave this untranslated. As such, it can sometimes be replaced by a verb ending. Compare, for example, this leaf is green and this leaf greeneth. Or from a, a study which um, Frege wrote when he prepared that paper, in the word greeneth, the verb ending replaces the copula, while the verb stem indicates the proper content. Now, greeneth might be a bit confusing to you. When apostrophizing the Christmas fir tree, Germans uh, didn't sing, thou art green in winter, but rather thou greenest in winter, du grünst im winter, as you may be able to confirm. Uh, these days, uh, Germans no longer sing, I'm afraid. <laughs> the component of the predicate is green, which indicates, as Frege puts it, the proper content is the general term. In an expanded sense of general term, we might as well say that in the one word predicate greeneth, the verb stem is the general term. In calling the copula is a mere form word der Aussage, Frege does not declare it to be semantically irrelevant. Now, what does he mean here by Aussage? This term is often used in the sense of Behauptung, that is to say statement, assertion. Now, the presence of the copula in a well-formed sentence does not at all ensure that the sentence is a proper vehicle for making a statement, ein Behauptungssatz, a declarative sentence, as you can see from, say, is Socrates courageous? But Aussage in Frege is not an alternative title for the kind of speech act he officially calls Behauptung, assertion. In traditional German grammar books, the predicate is often called the Aussage tile of a sentence, and this usage stands behind Frege's phrase, Frege's phrase, Bloß's Formwort der Aussage. It is meant to pick out that element of a certain part of a sentence S, in virtue of which that part is the predicate of S. So Frege too seems to think of the copula as a predicate forming operator on general terms. Invoking the broad reading of copula and general term, for which I have just now pleaded, we can now specify the truth conditions of elementary predications in such a way that light is thrown on the linguistic meaning of the copula. In his paper, um, Plea for the Copula, David Wiggins, I mean, the, the, the real title of the paper is always with Wiggins is a rather baroque structure, but that's the key phrase, Plea for the Copula. In this paper, David Wiggins has shown how the format of a Davidsonian truth conditions calculus can be adjusted to accommodate the copula. Ignoring tenses, uh, something I'm going to do all through this talk, we have a general principle uh, like T, which might be called a truth rule, an elementary predication of the firm singular term S plus copula plus general term G expresses the truth if and only G applies to the object which is denoted by S. Grammar tells us with which copula goes with which kind of general terms. Axioms fix the meanings of the atomic terms in elementary predications. I wrote down some specimens. Principle T and the axiom, axioms S1 and G1, for example, imply the theorem theta, that uh, uh, the sentence Socrates plus copula plus courageous expresses the truth if and only if Socrates is courageous. Principle T, together with the axioms for the simple general terms and for the names in our elementary predication, predications, fixes the linguistic meaning of the copula. 
Along these lines, we can give a satisfactory answer to the question which the young Wittgenstein once posed. In what way has the copula in elementary sentences meaning? Turn now to uh, part two of my talk entitled General Terms and Properties. The general term in our elementary predication, E, Socrates is courageous, applies to the philosopher whom the singular term in E denotes and to many other persons. Should our semantics associate with the general term over and above the objects to which it applies, if any, an additional entity? My answer is yes. Let me first spell out this answer before giving my reason for it. Our semantics should assign I suggest, to a general term G in a given use, the property which the combination copula plus G in that use can be impl employed to ascribe to an object. So in the case of the general term in E, the extra entity is courage, the property of being courageous. In associating general terms with properties, I may seem to be following Frege, but actually I'm not. The entities I call properties are more finely individuated, as we shall see in the next section, uh, than um, what Frege calls properties or, most of the time, concepts. Furthermore, my properties are objects, hence they are not incomplete or unsaturated, whatever that may mean. Finally, the semantical relation between a property, in my usage of this word, and a general term is not the same as that between the man Socrates and his name. That is to say, properties are not denoted by general term. The general term courageous, I shall say, borrowing a word, but not much more than this word from John Stuart Mill, connotes the property of being courageous. And all and only those objects to which this term applies exemplify this property. A general term G in language L connotes a property X if and only if in L the combination copula plus G serves to ascribe X to an object. Only general terms stand in this relation to properties. So the picture I recommend is what you see behind me. So is a property... What's, is there a term for the, con the relation between properties and individuals as the converse of the exemplification? Is, is uh, just take the, the passive voice. I mean, it's exemplified by or is had by or is possessed by. I think, think. The property that is connoted by the general term in my paradigm sentence E is denoted by the singular term in the following sentence P star on the handout. Courage is a virtue. The singular term in P star denotes a property which Socrates shares with all and only those who are courageous. What it denotes is not a particular, nothing datable or locatable, nothing which can interact causally with anything else. Contemporary ontologists tend to call objects that are particulars concrete and objects that are not particulars abstract. In a derivative sense, a term is classified as abstract, say, if it purports to denote an abstract object, or if it purports to apply only to abstract objects. So, looking at P star, we see that all the terms therein are abstract. The general term in P star applies only to properties, and it connotes, according to the semantic description I favor, a property of properties. So P star seems to deserve its star. After all, in Raphael's fresco, the school of Athens, Plato is pointing upwards. Other philosophers, both inside and outside the school of Athens, are bound to suspect that we have been led by linguistic will-o'-the-wisps into metaphysical swamps. Ever since Diogenes, advocates of what I shall call particularism, have complained that though well acquainted with tables, they have never come across any such thing as tablehood, all things that exist being particulars, as John Locke put it. Nowadays, particularists are commonly referred to as nominalists. I do not adopt this odd usage, 
Harvard Vintage 1947, because the historically resonant title nominalism is far more appropriate for a special brand of particularism, which, I shall, which we shall briefly encounter in section four of my paper. Grudgingly, I shall follow contemporary terminological practice, however, in calling those who deny that all things that exist are particulars Platonists. Note that in this usage, Platonism is defined as the denial of particularism. Stout particularists, as I shall call them, you find my um, idiosyncratic terminology on the handout, stout particularists maintain that truths seemingly about a non-particular called Fness are really truths about particulars, which are F. In this paper, I use Fness as a schema for abstract singular terms that are derived from general term from a general term F, no matter what the affix is or whether there is any thus covering steadfastness, wisdom, generosity, bravery, courage, etc. Stout particularists regard our P star as, mislead, as a misleading formulation of a claim about people who are courageous. Now, what does the earthbound paraphrase of P star look like? Hopefully not like this, whoever is courageous is virtuous, for there are ever so many scoundrels who are courageous. The following paraphrase looks more acceptable. Whoever is courageous is virtuous in at least one respect. But does this help our stout particularist? A respect in which several particulars resemble each other is hardly itself a particular. It looks as if the particularist avoids the appearance of referring to a single abstract object by quantifying over abstract objects. And this impression cannot possibly please him. Furthermore, Whoever is a member of my audience on March 5th, 2004, is virtuous in at least one respect. Is as true as can be, isn't it? But this statement does certainly not entail that being a member of that audience is a virtue. So why should the truth that whoever is courageous is virtuous in at least one respect ensure that courage is a virtue? Finally, even if the stout particularist were to succeed in this simple case, she would have to give us good reasons for believing that we should always succeed whenever abstract terms are used in the course of making a statement. A look at almost any page of theoretical writing confirms the suspicion that the particularist reductive program is a Sisyphean task. But let me break off at this point and simply give voice to a conviction. The particularist's paraphrastic endeavors are doomed to failure, and this holds not only for stout particularism, but also for the refined variety, which I shall introduce briefly at a later stage. Moreover, uh, and here I'm quoting a lovely passage from Peter Strawson's paper on universals. Moreover, even if the paraphrasability claim could be made good, the fact would not by itself serve the intended purpose. For it might be that the availability of the sentence to be paraphrased was a necessary condition of our thinking the thought to which we then tried to approximate in the substitute sentence or sentences. Committed in thought to what we shun in speech, we should then seem like people seeking euphemisms in order to avoid explicit mention of distasteful realities. Well, if all of this is correct, then the literal truth of a statement like P star ensures that there is at least one non-particular. The argument for this is fairly simple. Courage is a virtue, so there is at least one virtue. Virtues are shareable properties, and shareable properties are non-particulars. Hence, there is at least one non-particular. I take it that all the premises of this argument are conceptual truths. Hence, this bit of reasoning is a priori, through and through. Since the argument purports to prove the existence of entities of a certain kind, it has an air of pulling a rabbit out of a hat. And this impression has moved some philosophers to search for some way of bracketing our ascriptions of literal truth to higher level predications, Stephen Yablo being one of them. So far, I dare say, they have not yet made out their case. That's a fascinating program. 
Platonists should not let themselves be bullied by the epistemological question how on earth a non-particular like the property Fness could ever become cognitively accessible. By understanding the abstract singular term Fness is the proper answer, or at least the beginning of a proper answer. And this answer may serve to dispel the air of hocus pocus I mentioned a moment ago. If the question is whether certain intelligibilia, objects of thought alone, exist, why shouldn't the intellect have the power to answer it affirmatively in some cases? But let us now return to my proposal to enlist non-particulars for the semantics of general terms. The particularist's global worry should not be confused with the objection against any such proposal that was raised by, among others, Victor Dudman. He says, you can read it behind me, the invoking of an extra entity, a property or a class, over and above the objects of which the predicate is to be true, and the associating of it with the predicate is a quite gratuitous step. After all, what is the semantic role of a one-place predicate? This I should have thought, to be true of each severally of a number, perhaps not, of objects, and false of perhaps some others. Why then should we go beyond this conception to the extent of positing additional entities? Neglecting for a moment the difference, which matters to me, between general terms and predicates, Dudman's semantical predicate is true of, just like its Tarskian converse satisfies, corresponds to the semantical predicate applies to in my diagram. Dudman's question obtrudes itself even if the so-called Platonist is in the right against the particularist. Obviously, the denial of particularism does not by itself entail that any non-particular stands in the relation I dubbed being connoted by to any concrete general term. And certainly there is no need to assign non-particulars to general terms for the sake of specifying the truth conditions of elementary predications like my example E. This sentence expresses a truth we can say, and we did say it at the end of the first section, if courageous applies to the object denoted by Socrates. So far, there is no need to characterize general terms as connoting a property. If all terms in a given language are concrete, semanticists don't have to call non-particulars into service. <coughs> but by assigning properties to concrete general terms, we can explain, or so it seems to me, certain data in less primitive languages, data which would otherwise remain mysterious. In a rich language like ours, two ways of introducing a property into discourse are available. We can ascribe a property to an object using a copula and a general term, and we can make an identifying reference to it using a singular term. The ascriptive mode is exclusively used for introducing properties into discourse. Only properties are ascribables, and it is of their essence to be ascribables. The ascriptive mode has priority over the referential mode. You are not able to refer to properties, unless you have learned to ascribe them. Now, it is a remarkable fact that sometimes we use both modes almost in one and the same breath. For example, when we argue as follows, it's on the handout. Argument A, P1, Socrates is courageous, premise two, that is a virtue, therefore C, Socrates has at least one virtue. This argument is intuitively valid. And if we assign properties to general terms, we can easily explain why. The general term in P1 connotes the property that is denoted by the singular term in P2. It is not possible that this property is, as it is said to be, in premises P1 and P2, that is, exemplified by Socrates and a virtue, unless conclusion C is true. Argument A is not formally valid in the neoclassical predicate calculus, but it can easily be turned into a formally valid argument by a very simple maneuver that everybody who understands argument A is ready to perform. The move is from P1 to P1 star. Socrates has courage. 
So thanks to the invocation of an extra entity, as Dudman put it, we can make sense of the interaction between concrete general terms and abstract singular terms as witnessed in argument A, and I for one cannot see any other explanation of this phenomenon. But could the invocation of sets not do the same job and give us the additional advantage of not insulting Quinean sensibilities? Why not identify courage with a set of all and only those who are courageous? Well, that would certainly not be a good idea. This set is identical with the set of those who are courageous and die before their 200th birthday. But there might have been a courageous Methuselah who managed to reach this biblical age. And even if courage had not had been no more exemplified than immortality, courage would still be, dif be different from immortality, even though the set of the courageous would then have been identical with the set of the immortals. These objections would no longer arise if we were to follow David Lewis's footsteps and identify courage with the set of those who are courageous in some possible world or other. But if we were to accept this recommendation, we would lose the strategic advantage of being on good terms with Quine, since possible heroes are no more to Quine's liking than is heroism. More importantly, the identification of properties with sets has unpleasant consequences which are independent of any reservations against an ontology of possibilia. Each set has the property of being a set. If we follow Lewis, this property would have to be identical with the set of all sets. But Cantor's theorem shows that there can't be any such set. So all in all, we'd better acknowledge properties as abstract objects sui generis if we are ready to acknowledge them at all. In this section, I've argued that it uh, might be a good idea to assign to general terms an extra entity over and above the objects, if any, to which they apply. In the next section, which is a kind of interlude, I shall pile on the particularist's agony. Interlude, general terms and concepts. The general term in E connotes, I said, the property of being courageous. And now I add, this is the completed diagram. And now I add that it expresses the concept courageous. All and only those objects to which the general term courageous applies fall under this concept. I shall soon explain what I take this addition to be good for, but let me first spell it out a bit. Each general term in a given use expresses exactly one concept, and it connotes in that use at most one property. The question why in the case of properties I say at most one rather than exactly one will be answered in the final section of this paper. Thus understood, concepts, unlike properties, are not situated on the level of Regian Bedeutung, but rather on the level of Regian Sinn. So I'm not just offering two different epithets for the same thing. When is the property of being F identical with the property of being G? My answer declares a modal condition to be both necessary and sufficient. It's on the handout, mod. The property of being F is identical with the property of being G, if and only if necessarily all and only Fs are G. Here necessarily is to be understood in such a way that the set of logical truths is a proper subset of the set of conceptual truths, and the latter set is in turn a proper subset of the set of necessary truths. In my usage, the phrase metaphysically necessary applies to all and only those necessary truths that are not conceptual truths. According to Mod, a property that is denoted by a general term differs from the extension of that term. Even if the term a vertebrate with the heart and a vertebrate with the liver, you know the story, apply to the same objects, the property of being a vertebrate with the heart is different from the property of being a vertebrate with the liver. Like all other general terms that don't apply to anything, the terms a witch and a golden mountain have the same extension, but the property of being a witch isn't identical with the property of being a golden mountain. On the other hand, according to Mod, the property of being a Euclidean triangle is the same as the property of being a closed plane rectilinear figure whose internal angles add up to 180 degrees, for the corresponding universal quantification is a conceptually necessary truth. In this case, the property identity can be recognized a priori for what it is, 
but Putnam has taught us that this isn't always the case. According to Maud, the property of being a lump of common salt is identical with the property of being a lump of sodium chloride, but the corresponding universal quantification is a metaphysically necessary truth. We can only know a posteriori that this is the case. Criterion mod is partly legislative. It tries to tidy up our diffuse employment of the word property. If somebody were to protest against mod by saying, but look, triangularity isn't the same property as trilaterality, one could not accuse her of misusing our word property. At this point, I'm wholly with David Lewis, who writes about this very example. Necessarily, all and only triangles are trilaterals, yet don't we want to say that triangularity and trilaterality are two different properties? Well, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I don't see it as a matter of dispute. It's not as if we have fixed once and for all in some perfectly definite and unequivocal way on the things we call the properties. Rather, we have the word property introduced by way of varied repertory, repertory of ordinary and philosophical uses. The word has thereby become associated with a role in our commonsensical thought and in a variety of philosophical theories. It is wrong to speak of the role associated with the word property as if it were fully and uncontroversially settled. Furthermore, I believe that the intuitions which underlie that protest can be budgeted for by distinguishing properties as conceived in accordance with mod from concepts. So here come briefly to concepts. One possesses, one possesses the concept F if one is able to think of objects as F. If one understands the general term F or any of its synonyms, one is in possession of the concept F. The concept F differs from the concept G if it is possible that somebody is thinking of an object X as F without being able to think of X as G. Somebody who is able to think of a figure on the blackboard as a triangle needn't be able to think of it as a closed plane rectilinear figure whose internal angles add up 280 degrees. After all, not everybody who is able to recognize figures as triangles has had lessons in geometry. Somebody who is able to think of the content of a terrine as a liquid that contains too little salt need not be able to think of that content as a liquid that contains too little sodium chloride. After all, not everybody who is able to recognize that the soup needs some more salt has had lessons in chemistry. Both examples show that the concept F may differ from the concept G, even if the property of being F is identical with the property of being G. For this reason, my answer to the question, when is the concept F the same as the concept G, declares a cognitive condition to be both necessary and sufficient. It's cog on the handout. The concept F is identical with the concept G, if and only if nobody can think of an object that it is F, without thinking of that object that it is G and vice versa. Now, one entry in diagram two still awaits comment. The concept X that is expressed by a general term determines the property Y just in case every general term that expresses X connotes Y. We saw that several concepts can determine one and the same property. And in section six, we shall see that not every concept determines a property. But no concept determines more than one property. So if you know which concept is expressed by a given general term, you know eo ipso which property, if n, is connoted by that term. But if you know which property is connoted by a given general term, you might not know which concept it expresses. And now the point of assigning concepts to general terms is coming into sight, or so I hope. In order to grasp what somebody said to apply the term f to an object, it doesn't suffice to know which property is connoted by F. You may know, for example, perhaps because some Plato scholar told you so, that the term courageous connotes the property which was the topic of a debate between Plato, Socrates and two Athenian generals, Laches and Nicias. Whereas you do not yet know what is said when this term is predicated of, predicated of someone. In order to understand an utterance of our notorious sentence E, you must know which concept is expressed by courageous.
which brings me to uh, section four of my paper. Elementary predications and their quasi-platonic counterparts. In this section, I shall compare the elementary predication Socrates is courageous, which with what I call following Ryle, uh, its quasi-platonic counterpart, which has also found, as you will have noted, its way into my diagrams. So we have QP, quasi-platonic. Socrates exemplifies or possesses or has courage, where well, exemplifies is the uh, successor for uh, Plato's met echai, participates in. Obviously, quasi-platonic sentences like QP differ syntactically from elementary predications like E. We find a verb and a noun in QP which doesn't occur, which don't occur in E. My question is whether they differ semantically. Philosophers who have considered this question have given opposite answers. Bernard Bolzano, Frank Ramsey, and Peter Strawson have denied that there is any semantical difference between the members of such pairs. Now, I can't go into all these historical details here. We have Bolzano, where he ought to be placed at the top of it, and then, uh, Strawson, and then Ramsey and Strawson. Let me just read out the Ramsey quote. It seems to me as clear as anything can be in philosophy, so the man is appealing to self-evidence, as clear as anything can be in philosophy, that the two sentences, Socrates is wise and wisdom is a characteristic of Socrates, which in Ramsey is a stylistic variant of uh, Socrates exemplifies or is characterized by wisdom, express the same proposition. They are not, of course, the same sentence, but they have the same meaning, just as two sentences in two different languages can have the same meaning. Which sentence we use is a matter either of literary style or of the point of view from which we approach the fact. If the center of our interest is Socrates, we say E. If we are discussing wisdom, we say QP. But whichever we say, we mean the same thing. QP means no more and no less than E. It is merely a lengthened verbal form. And the same line is taken by Peter Strauss. Now, on the other side of the fence, um, we have um, Bertrand Russell in The Principles of Mathematics and Wilfried Sellers. They maintain that there is a semantical difference between E and its quasi-platonic um, counterpart. Um, let me just go very briefly into Sellers. According to Wilfried Sellers, quasi-platonic sentences are crypto-semantical sentences. QPs, Sellers contends, has the same content as the explicitly semantical sentence you find on the handout, SEM. Every sign token that is functionally equivalent with tokens of courageous in the language of this very utterance applies to Socrates. And those of you who know Sellers know that he uses this dot quote uh, convention. But if you want to spell this out, I mean, we didn't grow up uh, by talking dot quotees. Yeah? If you spell this out, you end up with something like my them. If that is correct, that, I mean, that QP comes to the same thing as them, right? Uh, then E does certainly not have the same content as QP, for the statement that Socrates is courageous doesn't have any linguistic subject matter, as Zen does. Sellers is an advocate of refined or metalinguistic particularism, if you remember my schema on the handout. It is this variety of particularism that deserves the ancient title nominalism. Nominalists like Sellers follow Rosselin's and Abelard's footsteps in maintaining that statements seemingly about an abstract entity Fness are really statements about tokens of the general term F and all other tokens that play somehow the same role as F tokens. How plausible a view is this? Boris is a monoglot Russian. Boris has no information whatsoever about the English word courageous, the concept of functionally equivalent tokens does not belong to Boris's conceptual equipment. I'm not sure that it belongs to mine. But he knows quite a lot about Socrates. Boris does not certainly not believe that the proposition that it expressed by them, but this does not prevent him from believing that Socrates possesses courage. Hence, what is said by QP has a property which, is, which it does not share with what is said by them, namely the property of being the content of Boris's thoughts. So, by Leibniz's law, the former is not the same as the latter. Quasi-Platonic sentences and their Selassian counterparts do not express the same proposition. 
But remember, the main question to be settled here was this. Is our quasi-platonic sentence just a stylistic variant of the corresponding elementary predication? Sellers may have given a bad reason for the correct answer. And so it is, I believe. But there is something to be said for the opposite answer, too. So my claim is, putting just by name dropping, Russell and Sellers are actually right, but Bolzano, Ramsey and Strawson would have been right if the language to which QP and E belong had been expressively poorer than it actually is. Let me explain. It will turn out to be helpful to step back for a moment and to compare the following two sentences on the handout. S1, Anne kicked the ball. S2, Ben kicked the bucket. Sentence S1 contains two singular terms and a two-place predicate. It entails, among other things, that there is something Anne kicked, namely a ball. And it makes sense to ask whether the ball she kicked is the same as the one Ben had kicked the day before. Things stand very differently with S2. If we understand and believe this slangy death notice, we are not inclined to conclude that there is something that Ben kicked, namely a bucket. It would not make sense to ask whether the bucket he kicked is the same as the one that had been kicked the day before by a policeman in Baghdad. S2 seems to consist of one singular term and a one-place predicate. The general term kick the bucket, as used in our root statement, is an idiom. It has no semantic structure. We do not owe to our understanding of this expression, or, sorry, we do not owe our understanding of this expression to our comprehension of its components, kick and the bucket. In the semantics of the Davidson Wiggins type sketched at the end of section one, the term kick the bucket would be treated in the same way as walk, namely as, a sem as semantically atomic. Now back to QP. If this sentence contains two singular terms and a two-place predicate, like S1, then there is a semantical difference between QP and E. But we cannot find out whether the word courage occurs in QP as a singular term, rather than in the way in which the bucket occurs in S2, as long as we keep on staring only at this sentence. Quine saw the decisive point when he wrote in Word and Object, The move that ushers in abstract singular terms has to be one that simultaneously ushers in abstract general ones. The emergence of abstract singular terms is not to be separated from that of abstract general terms. If the word courage in QP really is a singular term, then one does not understand it as such unless one has learned to use it also in higher level predications like P star, courage is a virtue, where it enjoys the company of an abstract general term. As part of a language in which such higher level predications can be formulated, QP is not merely a stylistic variant of E. But since courage is not joined within this sentence by a simple abstract general term, one can call QP, again following Quine, a degenerate specimen of that higher part of language. But let us look now at the other side of the coin. It is one of the great merits of Benjamin Schneider's forthcoming book on substances and properties that he does look at both sides. Imagine a variant of English, call it basic English, that is expressively poorer than the language I am presently trying to speak. It does not provide its speakers with the resources for higher level predications like P star. Particularists would presumably delight in this language. In basic English, no abstract general terms are available. However, sentences of the type A exemplifies Fness do belong to basic English too. But Fness never occurs in any other position than at the right-hand side of exemplifies. Alias has, alias possesses. In basic English, sentences of the form A exemplifies Fness contain only one singular term and a non-relational predicate which results from applying the polysyllabic copula exemplifies dash ness to the general term f. Such sentences of basic English are in the same boat with Ben kicked the bucket in English. 
In that death notice, the predicate is also obtained from a semantically atomic general term, kick the bucket, by applying a copula, more precisely the tensed copula id, to the verb stem kick. In basic English, exemplify courage is treated as an idiom, treated as though it had no semantic structure. Hence, in that language, the difference between Q, P and E is indeed simply a matter of stylistic variation. It is instructive at this point to consider Stephen Schiffer's pleonastic conception of properties in this light, if light it really is. Schiffer writes, you can read this again behind my back, a striking feature of properties is how swiftly and easily we appear to get committed to their existence. They exhibit a something from nothing feature. The trivial transformation takes one from a sentence in which no reference is made to a property to a sentence that evidently contains a singular term whose referent is a property. Thus, from E, here I'm replacing uh, Schiffer's uh, barking dog by my beloved Socrates, thus from E, Socrates is courageous, whose only singular term is Socrates, we can infer its pleonastic equivalent, QP. Socrates has the property of being courageous, wherein the ostensible singular term, the property of being courageous, evidently refers to the property of being courageous. Subject to a certain qualification, each predicate F determines a property, the property of being F, thanks to determining a nominalization, the property of being F, which can't fail of reference. The reason for the caveat in Schiffer's final statement will be considered in section 6. It's the same reason that made me refrain from saying that every general term connotes a property or that each concept determines a property. The move from Schiffer's E to his QP does not have the same structure as the transition from E to our QP, for Schiffer's conclusion invokes the categorical concept of a property. But this doesn't very much alter the situation, for again I claim that the more verbose sentence would be just a stylistic variant of the shorter one if expressions of the type the property of being F were only to be found at the right hand side of has. As a sentence of basic English, Schiffer's QP contains only one singular term, and the phrase has the property of being is a polysyllabic copula. To be sure, the predicate in Schiffer's QP very much looks as if it contains a singular term, but that also holds for the English idiom kicked the bucket. How could you incur an ontological commitment that you had not shouldered before just by moving from a sentence to its pleonastic equivalent, just by becoming more verbose? How can the latter have additional existential implications? Even Strawson and Quine are agreed on this question, though not on much else, when they say... The idea is that QP, Socrates possesses bravery, commits us, as regards bravery, commits us, in a way in which we are not at all committed by E, Socrates is brave. But this is absurd. The theory of commitment by noun, but not by adjective, is as absolutely implausible as any philosophical view could be. Quine, reacting to this several years later, he was right about the implausibility and absurdity of the idea, but wrong in supposing, if he did, that the idea was mine. The difference between E and QP is indeed too frail a read to bear the weight of an ontology. If it is true that in maintaining E we do not commit ourselves to the existence of properties, we see only a nothing from nothing transformation when staring at the move from Schiffer's E to Schiffer's QP. In English, as opposed to basic English, that part of QP, which Schiffer sometimes calls with justified caution an ostensible singular term, really is a singular term, for it also occurs in higher level predications. And about such predications, Stephen Schiffer himself says, I doubt that the statement, I'm quoting, I doubt that the statement that courage is a virtue is pleonastically equivalent to any statement not containing a singular term referring to courage. If the particularist's reductive aspirations are indeed doomed to failure, then our statement that courage is a virtue entails an existential statement, 
and in making that statement we explicitly commit ourselves to the existence of properties, unless there is a plausible way of bracketing our ascriptions of literal truth to higher level predications. Thus, the weight of an ontology is borne by irreducible higher level predications rather than by the difference between adjective and noun. One cannot participate in the language game of higher level predications unless one has learned to understand elementary predications like E. But one need not be able to take part in any of those higher level games in order to understand elementary predications. This one-sided dependency claim as about comprehension, is to be sharply distinguished from the dubious reducibility claims upheld by both stout and refined particulars. Furthermore, the one-sided dependency I've emphasized does not entail that we cannot understand any abstract singular term S, which purports to denote a property of a particular, unless we understand a concrete general term from which S is derived by nominalization. Not only does this not follow, it isn't even true. No word in present-day English stands in the same syntactical relation to animosity in which curious stands to curiosity. Turn now to the penultimate section of my paper entitled Nominal and Non-Nominal Quantification. With trepidation, Frederike, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our elementary predication E, Socrates is courageous, implies the existential quantification on the handout E1. Socrates is, some, sorry, somebody is courageous. There's somebody who is courageous, for some X, X is courageous. In moving to E1, we quantify into the position of a singular term. And that's something we also do in our language when we move from the premise QP, Socrates exemplifies courage, to the existentially quantified conclusion, QP1 on the handout, for some x, Socrates exemplifies x. Conclusions E1, for some x, x is courageous, and conclusion QP1, for some x, Socrates exemplifies x, um, equally comply with the principle which Quine upheld of early and of late. Here's a potpourri of quotations. Variables are pronouns and make sense only in positions which are available to names. Singular terms are accessible to positions appropriate to quantifiable variables, while general terms are not. To put the predicate letter F in a quantifier is to treat predicate positions suddenly as name positions, and hence to treat predicates as names. Variables eligible for quantification therefore do not belong in predicate positions. By Quinean lights, quantification, that is to say non-substitutional quantification, when I say quantification I always mean non-substitutional quantification, by Quinean lights, quantification is always nominal quantification. When he says variables are pronouns, he means that they are pronames, placeholders for singular terms. It is universally agreed that variables are proforms, but that they can only be pronames is very implausible. In the sentence, not only Socrates is courageous, Nikias is so as well, the proform so is an anaphorical placeholder for courageous. And there is something Socrates and Nikias both are seems to be as significant as there is something Socrates and Nikias both exemplify. So many have objected to Quine that the argument on the handout, E, Socrates is courageous, so Socrates is something. There is something Socrates is. is. Uh, for some f, Socrates f is just as valid as that from e to e1. Here we quantify into the position of courageous, but in making this move we do not suddenly treat that position as name position, as Quine suspects. This becomes clear as soon as we expand our conclusion by a namely writer. Socrates is something, namely courageous. In contrast to qp1, the namely writer for e2 could not be namely courage, for the second is in E2, there's something Socrates is, is the copula from E. And a copula isn't a sentence forming operator on singular terms. Since the copula of premise E survives in the conclusion E2, the position quantified into is not that of a predicate, 
but that of a general term. But the term courageous isn't a name either, so the objection stands. The variable in our quantification is not a pro name. The move from E to E2 also shows that the predicate is courageous is by no means a semantically seamless whole that contains the general term. As Quine put it, mere, quoting, merely as a constituent syllable comparable to the rat in Socrates. Surely we cannot quantify, non-substitutionally, into the position of a syllable. We can now characterize the special semantical status of the copula as follows. The only word position in E which one cannot quantify into is that of the copula. The copula in any of its guises does not denote anything. It doesn't connote anything either. Hence, a fortiori, it does not connote exemplification. Note that the copula in QP is not the word exemplifies, for that is a two-place predicate. The copula in QP is the verb ending, and the stem of that verb is the general term that connotes exemplification. Similarly, from the proposition that epsilon on the handout Socrates walks, we can not only conclude that there is at least one walker, but also that Epsilon 2, Socrates does something. There's something Socrates does for some V, Socrates Vs. When moving to E2, Epsilon 2, sorry, we quantify into the position of the verb stem. But this is not to treat this position suddenly as name position, as can be seen from the expansion of our conclusion. He does something, namely walk. Now, just as in the case of E2, it needs to be emphasized that the position quantified into when moving to epsilon 2 is not that of a predicate. In natural languages like English or German, and I guess in French too, uh, there simply is no such thing as quantification into predicate position. That's something both friends and foes of non-nominal quantification tend to overlook. But the point to be made against the Quinean obsession with name variables remains entirely unaffected by this observation, for neither in E2 nor in Epsilon 2 do we quantify into the position of a singular term. Now, what is the relation between the quantification E2, Socrates is something, that is sneered at by Quine for no good reason, and its quasi-Platonic counterpart, QP1, for some X, Socrates exemplifies X, which is kosher also by Quinean lights. It is tempting to reply the relation is the same as that between its unquantified predecessors, E and QP. But remember that in basic English, exemplifies courage is an idiom, like the predicate in the slangy death notice. And from Ben kicked the bucket, you wouldn't want to infer Ben kicked something. So in basic English, QP1 is just gibberish. But in real English, it is not, of course. In that language, abstract general terms are available, and we can embed QP1 in sentences in which the bound variable steps out of the shadow of exemplifies, as in the dash example on the handout, uh, for some x, Socrates exemplifies x, and x is a virtue. You need not be able to cope with higher level predications in order to understand E2. So QP1 is conceptually more demanding than E2. Therefore, the difference between these two quantifications is not merely a matter of stylistic variation. How are quantifications into the position of general terms to be characterized semantically? My preferred characterization is this. Sentences like E2, for some F, Socrates is F, are higher order quantifications over properties. What is that supposed to mean? The bound variable f is associated with a range of objects, namely properties, which are its values. So it is objectual ontic quantification. But it is quantification into general term position, hence it is not first order quantification like E1 or like QP1 for some x Socrates exemplifies x. Permissible substituents for f do not denote the values of this variable. That is done by singular terms, such as courage, which can re replace the variable x in QP1. Permissible substituents for f con connote the values of this variable. So this variable resembles variables in first-order quantifications in having values, but having a value is not the same for both. E2 expresses a truth if and only if, there is at least one object within the range of its variables, that is, a property which meets the following condition. 
The object denoted by Socrates is such that it exemplifies that property. Proceeding along these lines, we conceive, of, we conceive of quantifications into the position of general terms as non-nominal quantifications over the same, very same entities which we saw reason to assign to general terms before the advent of quantification into their position. So this gives us a nicely unified picture. Admittedly, if Anne asserts that there is something Socrates is, she does not presuppose the existence of any object which she was not yet committed to when claiming that Socrates is courageous. I do not mean to deny this. If a theorist, in his attempt to give the semantics of a language L, explicitly invokes the assumption that there are properties, he does not thereby ascribe this commitment to the speakers of L. He may reasonably refrain from doing the latter. Nowadays, David Armstrong is the best-known advocate of a parsimonious conception of properties. Armstrong embraces the scientia mensura principle, as I would like to call it. The natural sciences are the measure of all things, of those that are that they are, and of those that, they are, that are not that they are not. According to Armstrong, there is no such thing as the property of being F unless F, or some synonym, belongs to the basic vocabulary of what he calls total science. Bad prospects for my paradigm of a property. The term courageous is not likely to become accredited by science as an indispensable part of its vocabulary. An advocate of the generous conception of properties, such as I, can and should concede that only a tiny minority of his abundant properties is needed for the explanatory and prognostic purposes of the natural sciences in general and of physics in particular. Now, generosity should not degenerate into prodigality. First of all, it should be clear that not every significant abstract singular term that purports to denote a property really does so. Here is a very somber example which should survive, suffice to drive this point home. Consider the singular term, the virtue for which all survivors of the Holocaust <coughs> love Hitler. Secondly, not every significant general term connotes a property, and consequently not every abstract singular term that is derived by nominalization from a general term denotes a property. If we do not acknowledge this, we are bound to run into a contradiction. This is shown by the property version of Russell's paradox. It runs as follows. Some properties exemplify themselves, like every other property. The property of being incorporeal is itself incorporeal. And the pop property of being self-identical, like everything else, is self-identical. But normally properties do not exemplify themselves. The property of being a philosopher isn't a philosopher. And whatever Plato may have thought, courage is certainly not courageous, not even perfectly courageous. Let us call a property normal if and only if it does not exemplify itself, then we can truly say, and on the handout, courage is a normal property. Now consider the general term in N. Does it connote a property? If, is there such a thing as the property of being a normal property? Well, if so, the question arises whether it is, is it, whether it is itself a normal property. And the logically embarrassing answer is, as you all know, if it is normal, then it isn't. And if it is not normal, then it is. Hence, there cannot be such a thing as the property of being normal. Consequently, the general term in N does not connote, and the term which results from its nominalization does not denote any property. In uttering N, we rightly say about a certain property that it does not exemplify itself but we do not thereby ascribe a property to it. The paradoxicality of the paradox is due to the fact that we find the assumption so very natural that one ascribes a property to an object whenever one says of that object that it is thus and so. Now, this paradox is also relevant for the question that we confronted in the last section, the question how are quantifications into general term position to be understood? How relevant it is has been recently shown by Augustin Rayo and Stephen Yablo, who say that they have adopted the argument from George Boulos, hence my acronym for the following example. Consider Brian. Maybe on the hand up, I don't remember. 
There is something courage and wisdom both are, namely normal, but there is no such thing as the property of being normal. This statement seems to be consistent. If appearances are not deceptive, then the truth conditions of the first conjunct of Bry cannot be those of a higher order quantification over properties. So the view I advanced in the last section threatens to collapse. Does it? Uh, prima facie, there are uh, three reactions um, to this problem, uh, which are possible. Uh, you can read them behind me. First, appearances are deceptive. Bra is inconsistent, for the first conjunct can only be understood as a higher order quantification over properties. Reaction number two, Bra is consistent, but we must understand the quantification in the first conjunct along other lines than in standard cases. Reaction number three, Bra is consistent, so quantifications should never be understood as quantifications over properties. The stubborn reaction, number one, is rather implausible, I think. Rayo and Yablo plead for three, and other philosophers have also denied that variables in non-substitutional quantifications into position of general terms have values. Higher order quantification, they claim, isn't a special kind of objectual quantification, but rather sui generis. The delicate question is then, of course, what the semantics for such quantifications is to look like. We can easily specify in the meta-language a sufficient condition for the truth of a sentence like for some f Socrates is f. If we quantify over sentences, then we can say uh, for some f Socrates is f, the sentence expresses a truth if there is a substitution instance of the open sentence after the quantifier that expresses a truth. But this isn't good enough because we need a bicondition. For the biconditional, we need in our meta-language a counterpart to the fonts for some f quantifier in the object language. Then we can say, for some f Socrates is f, expresses a truth, if and only if, there is something the entity denoted by Socrates is. That's the key idea. I've never seen it developed in detail, but I also do not know of any argument that shows that this account of non-nominal quantification is mistaken. On the other hand, Bry does not show, I think, that the sui generis account, as one might call it, is the only game in town. Reaction two is, I think, at least as plausible. If one reads the first conjunct of Bry as higher order quantification over properties, the conjunction is indeed inconsistent. But there is a different reading under which Bry is consistent and which does not boil down to alternative three. Consider a similar problem case in the field of first-order quantification. It's example Z on the handout. There is an Olympian goddess who is depicted on several paintings in this gallery, namely Venus. But as we all know, there are no goddesses, Olympian or not. This statement is inconsistent if the quantifier is given the same reading in both conjuncts. But the impression of inconsistency disappears if we understand the first conjunct along the following lines. There is a true positive answer to the question which Olympian goddess is depicted on several paintings in this gallery, namely the answer that Venus is depicted on several of those paintings. It should be clear in any case that our everyday use of there are objects which cannot always be captured by for some x, x, unless we go minongin. Consider this, there are objects objects which exist according to him, though not according to me, namely flying saucers. Now, Bry can be treated, and I think it should be treated in a similar fashion. Enlightened by the property version of Russell's paradox, we see that the expression there is in the first conjunct of Bry shouldn't be rendered by the quantifier for some f. The first conjunct should rather be understood along the following lines. There is a true positive answer to the question what courage and wisdom both are, namely the answer that they are both normal. Thus we read the recalcitrant conjuncts in Z and in Bry as first-order quantifications over propositions. If the Russellian trouble forces us to restrict the assumption that a property is ascribed to an object whenever that object is said to be thus and so, then it should not come as a surprise that it also enjoins us to restrict the assumption that a sentence of the form that is something A is, namely F, can only, be, only express a truth if there is a property, namely Fness, such that the object denoted by A exemplifies that property. In neither case does the Russellian trouble show that the assumption is always false. 
So we can continue to read quantifications into the position of general terms, save for those that are paradox engendering, as non-nominal quantifications over those entities, which we saw reason to assign to general terms quite independently of the language game of non-nominal quantification. Thanks a lot, mainly for your patience. <laughs>
committing ourselves to the one pre-given explanation of the term normal, then we don't really have any conception of what it is that we're saying when we say that. And we should deny that there's a truth condition yeah. expressed yeah. by the sentence, and we should also deny that there's any property. On the other hand, it seems to me that there probably is somewhere around some way of improving and sort of capturing what it was that pre-theoretically we must have had in mind. And I mean, of course, you know, theories of types are supposed to show us how we can you would say some of the things that we wanted to say when we committed ourselves to paradoxes without committing ourselves to the paradoxes. So yeah. there's some tidied up version of what it is that we say. Yeah. Now, suppose you've got a tidied up version of one of the things that you say, then you'll have a corresponding property as well. So why not have a problem? Why not stick yeah. to your guns and say yeah. this really is uh, property involving, or committing us to the existence of properties to the extent that anything is said at all? And to the extent that you haven't got properties here, yeah. nothing really is said. It's That's just a mess, just a yeah. guff. That's most interesting, right? Uh, I mean, there's a trivial reason for why I didn't try this out. Um, uh, I can't make up my mind what is the intuitively most satisfactory uh, answer uh, to this uh, uh, Russell an uh, analog to Russell's paradox. I mean, there are countless strategies how one can avoid getting into a mess. Yeah? But it's what is the intuitively most uh, satisfactory answer I'm at a loss here. Uh, technically speaking, too. <laughs> um, uh, saying that uh, we don't know really what we are saying, the first conjunct of Udo's right or young or up there um, seems to be perhaps a bit stubborn. Uh, I, mean, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, look at the namely rider. Yeah? I mean, first I explain uh, in an exemplificatory style this namely rider. Yeah, as I did. Uh, look, uh, courage isn't courageous, is it? Uh, uh, whereas uh, no, the, the, um, uh, the property of being uh, self-identical is, like everything else, self-identical. So I introduce the term normal, right? Uh, 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 and then um, I'm justified in saying, am I not, uh, that there's something courage and wisdom both are, namely uh, normal. Um, if I, I, I can easily verify this uh, by saying... Uh, well, current, uh, courage isn't uh, uh, courageous, uh, nor is wisdom wise, uh, so there's something they both are. I mean, there are many things they are both are, both are properties of Socrates and, and so on and so forth, but the uh, most interesting, ter theoretically speaking, most interesting, uh, yeah, get, nah, now we're getting into a mess, thing they have in common is normality. Well, better not talk this way, thing they have in common, namely normality, because then you assume that there is such a thing. Yeah? as the property of being normal and, I mean, for the reasons uh, which are well known, uh, there isn't. Um, so that makes me hesitant just to say bluntly, uh, we don't know, before we get this marvelous theory of how to decently avoid in an intuitively satisfactory way that paradoxical mess, we don't know what we are saying in the first line of, of Bry. Well, I mean something like, we are making a vague statement which is going to be true under some yeah, firmings see. up and not true under other I see. firmings up. Yeah. I mean, if you paraphrased the first half of the yeah. sentence as there is something that courage and wisdom both are, namely normal with all that that strictly involves, you'd have to say, well, after all, actually, that's false. That's really false. But uh, they aren't normal with all that that involves. I mean, because all that that involves is, uh, you know, a lot of paradoxical stuff that, that yeah. follows. Yeah. So they aren't such that yeah. they are normal and true is false. Yeah. They can't be like that. So we really just, I, I think we don't know what we mean yeah. when we yeah. say this. I mean, that is, we obviously, in some analytic sense, we mean what we mean. But that could be an entirely vague claim. Um, that's what it's the sense in which it's, it's entirely indeterminate where one has to look in the world, but not entirely indeterminate, somewhat indeterminate, yeah. where we have to look for the truth conditions of the statement. So you are saying uh, when we claim this, um, and if we are careful, then we are not claiming more that uh, than 
under some way of uh, getting rid of the vagueness involved, uh, we can truthfully say yeah, uh, that that is something that wisdom and courage both are. Uh, and this way, hopefully, will allow me, as you said, sticking to my guns, uh, hopefully, uh, to allow me to uh, assign a property to that predicate as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So I agree with uh, Justin about uh, the attractiveness of the of our yeah. feature that you present. Actually, there are many features that I find attractive. I also have a little reservation about the, the arguments at the end. Yeah. And so just to make sure, but you, are, you both think uh, that I shouldn't become depressed by the uh, Bulos, Rayo, Yablo. I mean, this struck me as a lightning <laughs> when, yes, I, when, awesome. I, when I looked at the, this argument. I mean, uh, you, you, you seem both to be suggesting, I mean, I'm just asking yeah. for <laughs> moral support, uh, that this is not yet a reason to give up. As far as I'm yeah. concerned, yeah. I tend to think that, I mean, of course, the third reaction is very understandable. But, but, but as far as you're concerned, you might very well have said this. You see, like the first reaction is to say it's stubborn and so on. But you have this distinction between concepts and properties. So you might well accept that in this particular case, we have a concept of a normal property. But there is no property, actually, that's determined by this concept. Yeah. You could say that. And therefore, that I think that would account for the fact that you say we have good intuitions, that we are sort of a, we understand, we grasp what we're saying when we say there is something courage and wisdom both are, maybe normal properties. So that was your reply. You said that we, we grasp, we understand what is said. Yeah. So, so that's in a certain sense of what is said, is the conceptual sense. That is, there is a certain concept that we grasp that yeah. concept. You said what, that what we grasp when we grasp something is the concept. Yeah. But you may certainly say that there is a concept, but there is no property. Yeah. And therefore, you would have to say, I think, in that case, uh, you would have to accept, I think, the inconsistency. Because you would have a certain mental sentence, as it were, in mind. You have certain concepts organized in a certain way. You take that to express a certain proposition. Well, I don't know exactly how the details would go with this, but, the, but at least, I think, that you could go for this inconsistency claim. Yeah. Yeah. In so far as by saying there is something to and wisdom both are, according to you, that commits me or commits the speaker to there being such a property, you might, you might well say. So you think actually that there is one, but there is not. And and I, I it's as far as intuitions are concerned, it's it strikes me as actually inconsistent, usually inconsistent but I can hardly make sense of the of, of the position of someone who tries to maintain both. Yeah. So now regarding this distinction between concepts and, and, and properties, uh, we don't use it so much in the no. in yeah. the book. For example at one point you discuss sellers in Ramsey and you have the, the, the argument on Seller's behalf is that, uh, so there is this sentence Sen, and there is the original E, so this is courageous, and it's possible to believe one thing and not to believe the other, and that shows that there are different properties. Not quite, Francois. I mean, here, here, here the comparison is between Seller's Sen, mm -hmm. on the one hand, uh, which is supposed to spell out what we mean Q when we say QP. Uh, Socrates exemplifies courage. Mm -hmm. And then I had an argument against that claim as to these two uh, statements being tantamount. You mean QP and... QP and, and seller, the seller stuff. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And then I went on, sorry, and just, just to set okay. the thing. Yeah. Then I went on to say, well, sellers may give uh, uh, not in terribly convincing reason for his claim that yes, E sure, sure. and QP sure. uh, do not come to the same thing, uh, but he may be right in claim, claiming that there's a semantic difference. Sorry, no, no, no. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's compatible with, so my point was that, again, this uh, sort of Freudian notion that it's possible to, uh, to ascend to one thing and not to ascend to the other, that only comes on the conceptual level, right. in your terms. Yeah. So not the other level that's more referential. Yeah. 
So, so there was this notion of semantic content at stake, and there is a notion of semantic content which is not the conceptual level for us at more. Yeah. We might say that it's still the same proposition, they still express the same proposition at this maybe more referential level. Even if conceptually there is a difference between Socrates and revised courage and the same. So there might still be equivalent at some relevant level, given that you have all the distinctions, including the distinction between yeah, yeah, I think I should, should simply say yes. Uh, on a certain level, they, they, are, they are equivalent. But here the claim was that, uh, I mean, there are strong injunctions as to that, that they being synonymous in service. He, he uses this uh, for claiming that, well, they are not. Could be one, it's there. Yeah. But, but you have more distinctions that he has yeah, anyway. So. Yeah. And now, the last question I have is about the, the, maybe the need for some other level, some extra level. Uh, now it's not very clear in my mind, but I've given the phenomenon of deference. So like cases of an M, I can think about M, so <coughs> things like that. And I think that what that shows... Sorry, I, I just didn't get this, this example. You know, Putnam's examples of... The Elms, I see. You can't distinguish an Elm from a beach, I remember. <laughs> so maybe in some cases we use terms, which expresses, the terms in, in our mass expresses, express certain concepts, and the concepts determine properties, but we may not quite know w what concept they do express the terms, even yeah. in our mass, because there is some differential connection yeah. to others. And in that case, there certainly is something in the mind of the person who speaks. And what is in the mind of the person who speaks is something like a differential character in Kaplan's sense, something that actually determines the concept in the social environment. Yeah. So there would be an extra level. There would be the concept that not necessarily something that the speaker himself grasps, but that's determined by what is in his mind together with yeah. contextual factors. Yeah. And that so determines the concept. What is it? So there is what is in the mind, what is actually grasped individually by the person, and then there is the concept that's Contextually expressed, and then there is the property that's determined by the concept. So there yeah. would be three levels. I'm very sympathetic to that. Two. I'm very sympathetic to that. Yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, very often our our hold on a concept is kind of parasitic, right? Um, as in these uh, as in these cases. Um, and I hope that uh, my hope was that the examples I used uh, uh, did not immediately enforce one uh, to introduce that further level, but in the long run. I guess one should, yeah. So to go back to the, the, the thing I started with, that is the argument that, yeah, I don't know exactly what you would have to say, but I think that what matters is that the speaker himself is not, doesn't quite know, so here I agree with you, does not quite know what is said by what he's saying, what he's saying, there is something that... Uh, I don't wisdom and courage. Wisdom and courage. Yeah. Are, uh, both are. Uh, so the, maybe the person he grabs something, definitely. Yeah, that's the reason why he thinks that he can say that, and we have all those intuitions that we know what we're saying. But at some other level, we don't know what we're saying. And even that there are the three levels, there is only one of them that really corresponds to what is in the mind, and that explains our intuitions about how rational it is to say such a thing. But the other levels, they are not really in our control. Yeah. And even that they are not in our control, it may well be that we're saying something, that we are saying something that actually says nothing or says something false, but though it seems obvious to us that it is true. Yeah. So I don't know exactly the, the details of how that would go, but I think that's a possibility. So in this case, uh, uh, the deference would be, as it were, to uh, a subclass of logicians so, and mathematicians maybe. who so, figure out so the I solution don't know. to Either you could handle this in terms of this differential level, yeah. the, the yeah. highest level, or in terms of concept versus properties. I don't know exactly how to do mm. it, but mm. I think that there is a, probably a way of, of I think what you can easily show that the construction in um, Black on the Handle is can't be a different one. Right? So the kind of computation is the same. So you can say something, there's something courage and wisdom. There's several things courage and wisdom both are maybe normal, desirable, and complex, but it can be mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can we show? Yeah. So, so you can show. It must be of the same. So, you can assume it is of the same. Yeah. 
Yeah. Then just a question about um, that E2. What do you do when you say it is a job? Socrates has something interesting. So interesting is a Yeah. I must say I'm, I'm, I'm rather confused by this construction, I mean, which is obviously there in natural language. <laughs> it's something interesting because this uh, addition of the adjective, uh, interesting, uh, uh, seems to assimilate. I mean, interesting is something a person can be and a remark can be and so forth. Yeah? Seems to bring it again close to quantification into a singular term position. But it obviously isn't quantification into a singular term position. So what's the interesting exactly doing there in this context is something interesting. Perhaps one can say uh, there is something as uh, Socrates is such that being it, no, that wouldn't work, I mean, is interesting or would it? If, if there's any meaning, if there is something interesting Socrates is, I think you'll, 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 this is the right paradox. Mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, you would you would stick to the point. I mean, even when you add this, uh, the the uh, surely you would uh, interest something interesting. Even if you add this adjective, nevertheless, the point uh, we are safe in saying this is quantification, which is not to Quine's liking. It's not quantification into a singular term position. I mean, that that remains. So everybody has to find. I mean, it's not a particular worry for me. I mean, it worries me. Uh, but it's not a defect of the theory I'm proposing that one has to say something about that, right? Am I making sense, roughly? That it's, it's not obviously quantification? Sorry. Well, your observation about um, uh, there's a, a riddle how um, these sentences, a sentence like this is to be understood if we expand it a bit. Socrates is something interesting, something exciting, and so Something on. I never noticed. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the answer given to this question uh, should be compatible with the claim that this is what it seems to be, namely non-nominal quantification, right? Or am I opening open doors? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're different views. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just wanted yeah, you to provoke, <laughs> to provoke you to, put, to bring forth your view on that. Yeah, but my view is that, that you have in fact uh, a single term position there. It's just uh, taken by implicit normalization, mm -hmm. and then the interesting goes with this implicit normalization. Yeah. yeah. So one day we have to fight about this. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was in fact the same problem I had with Socrates. Is something. You say it's a second order quantification, right? And well, then it's not, it should be spelled out in the following way Socrates is something or other. It does, you know, it, there is some second order property uh, that describes the property that Socrates has. I mean, what does this or rather bring out uh, uh, more than, uh, well, you are moving from a specific with, claim, yes, yes. Socrates is courageous, to yes, a right. less specific exactly. one. Exactly. That's yeah. what you can derive. You yeah. cannot stay at the same level and, and derive something yeah. and not be tautological. Yeah. You have to go, it seems to me, uh, towards the sense that there is some property that is described by this property, and that's a second order quantification. I mean, there is an existence predicate which goes up in the, in the ontological level, it seems to yeah. me. Uh, so but you have to do something like that, you have a hierarchy of properties. But yes, I do. Uh, yes, I do. do. Yeah. So, uh, for example, the normal property then, uh, because this is the crux of the matter, how do you respond to the, to the definition that property is normal if and only if it does not exemplify itself, right? That's mm -hmm. the, uh, the Russellian problem. So, if you accept that there is a an ontological level of normality, then there is no, it seems to me, no inconsistency. You can say, well, there is something courage and wisdom both are, they are both normal, but the property of normality is of a second, or, a second order, you know, and the fact that normality is not normal is not inconsistent with the fact that there is something courage and, and wisdom have. 
didn't quite get this. What, yeah. you, what you are saying when you say there is no such thing as a property of being normal, I suppose that you use implicitly the idea that being normal would be exemplifying oneself. No, no. Uh, sorry. Uh, if you stare at if you stare at sentence n, uh, uh, courage is a normal property. I mean, the the, the question is, I mean, the Russellian worry is, um, does in, in 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 my jargon, phrased in my jargon, is does the general term in n, a normal property, the thing in italics, does that connote a property or not? Right. If we assume yeah that it does. We run into very bad trouble. Why? Why? I would like because to we uh, get into a contradiction. So, could you spell it out, please? <laughs> yeah, I'd like, yes, I'd like to know how you get to the contradiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, before I mess it up, right, because I'm getting a bit tired, um, here's what I said. Repeated it. Repeating it doesn't improve it, of course, but. Forgive me, I'm just trying to find the passage. Gosh. Some property, well, the moves were these. Some properties ex exemplify themselves, like every other property. The property of being incorporeal is itself incorporeal, and so on and so forth. But normally properties don't do that. The property of being a philosopher isn't a philosopher, and so on. Let us call a property normal if it does not exemplify itself. Then we can truly say N, courage is a normal property. Uh, now, does the general term in N connote a property? Is there such a thing as a property of being a normal property? If so, the question arises. No, at the point. If so, the question arises whether it is itself a normal property, and the logically embarrassing answer is: if it is normal, then it is not normal, and if it is not normal, then it is normal. Hence, there can't be such a thing as the property of being normal. Yeah, right. So, so it's, the problem is that you have you have lumped together two levels, right? The the property of, of normality of a normal property. Mm -hmm. And the property of normality of, of, a, of courage. Right. So, if you are dealing with the property of normality of a normal property, you are second order normality. You have a second order property of normality. It seems to me. Yes. If you if you want no, to, I see what you're you see that you can't be second order. Because the definition crosses over. Well, you have to add something yeah. to your definition. That's all. You have mm. to add that you are you are talking of a first order. Notion of normality. Sure. So, so you, you, you just can't exemplify itself. Yes. Yes, that's exactly the problem. Exactly. But then you have to build in a lot more structure just to explain why you are you have this problem and, and, and clarify it. I, I you know the idea that Jerome just articulated, I think, is, is very important because if you just stay at this level of very, you know, general terms. You, you don't have structure enough to show the very problem of exemplification. If exemplification is actually possible, then it well, must yeah, be yeah. made well, clear yeah, how, how it's, uh, you know. I take it that notions like exemplification, for example, are really trans-level. I mean, uh, Socrates exemplifies courage, ex uh, courage exemplifies the property of being a virtue, and so forth. So exemplifies, in the Quinean jargon, is neither a concrete uh, uh, predicate nor uh, abstract predicate, because yeah, on, on various levels you combine it, you can, uh, you combine it, can combine it with a concrete singular term and an abstract uh, singular term, with an abstract singular term and another abstract singular term, and so on so and so forth. Trans -level, then so it's translevel. It cannot be reflexive then. Right. So if it's translevel by definition, you cannot apply the property to itself. If it's translevel. Well, I didn't ex uh, apply exemplification to exemplification, did I, at any point? Uh, you know, you know the, the property is normal if it doesn't exemplify itself. Yes. Yeah. The... But that's not a... Well, obviously, it's not about exemplification and its logical behavior, is it? I just explain the predicate is normal uh, by the right-hand side negative predicate does not exemplify itself. 
perhaps I'm just not getting at your point. Wait, mm -hmm. You just said that it's translatable. Exactly, it's easy. So Isn't it intuitive? Yeah. So then it's it's kind of a, an expression of the way you use exemplifying that it doesn't exemplify itself. It doesn't exemplify itself? Well, well this is about courage, but not about exemplification. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I, I suppose that I, I would need more, more logical structure yeah, to yeah, understand yeah. The, the solution you are looking at. Presumably you are right about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> I, there is something about the section 3 comb yeah. that disturbs me. Um, this yeah. is a comb to the foundation of the identity yeah. concepts. And if we say that the concept here is uh, surface, and the concept of this form. Could anybody think of an object that it has a surface and no form? It doesn't seem so. And then it seems that you're talking about in this uh, foundation about the exemplification of the point of view should stay, since this is the identity of concepts, on the connotation that may be application. The problem mm -hmm. is that, that you mentioned thinking of an object, and that is yeah. a mental act. I see the problem. I see the problem. Because intuitively, of course, one would say that the uh, predicate is a surface and the predicate is a form, uh, certainly do not express yes. the same concept. Yes. I mean, the, the trouble uh, is the same with, of course, that's in the neighborhood here, uh, and in the written version, uh, this comes to the surface with uh, the intuitive uh, Frigian criteria uh, for a difference uh, of sense, right? Um, it's, um, uh, I insist, it's just that, an intuitive criterion for the difference of sense, right? Uh, because as soon as, I mean, speaking with predicates, as soon as you have two predicates, say half full and half empty, right? Um, um, where it is uh, a matter of course yeah, that everything which is a case where the one predicate applies to also is a case where the other predicate applies to and vice versa, then there can't be a guy who understands both these predicates, accepts the explication of the one, but has a different cognitive attitude to whether the other predicate applies to it. Yeah? So the Freudian criterion, as far as it goes, is fine when it, um, when the, it is a matter of determining uh, these two things express different concepts. I mean, concepts in my sense, obviously, not in the Freudian sense. Um, but it doesn't help us. Um, it, it, isn't, it doesn't amount to a, a necessary and sufficient condition. And as your reflection shows, and I should have been aware of this, uh, my uh, cog, yeah, uh, it provides us with the same problem. It seems to be only a necessary condition. It seems to be a condition for the difference of concepts, mm. right, yeah. um, in the neighborhood. Yeah? If you can very well think of something as an F without thinking of it as G, then you can be sure that yes. F and G express different concepts. Uh, but here I said more. I, I pretended that the positive version is true too, and that's a mistake. Thank you. Um, I have two brief remarks. I just want, I'm um, not convinced that there's not, not a way to understand the, the tension between the two existential quantifiers in uh, Z and Bright. But I just mentioned this because I think that, you, that it is possible to, to separate the, the um, the existential notion of the quantity notion uh, in the quantifier. So I think, I mean, without going by my own view, I mean, you, you could say that the first quantifier, there, there is an Olympian goddess who is depicted, blah, 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 has no existential commitment. You, have, you just have the quantity uh, notion. But then, of course, the other one, there are no goddesses, Olympian or not, is um, yeah. existential being yeah. uh, as. Um, Loaded, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can recommend it by exist in the same Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 That, that's just a remark. I, I think you, you can go this way without um, the Meinonkian ontological. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think so too. Uh, and I try to explain how uh, the first half of that can be understood without becoming Meinongian. I mean, 
as to if, I, if you wanted to make two points, may I, may I immediately say something? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, all this talk about ontological commitment uh, worries me greatly. I must say. Um, I mean, there was a first wave of discussion when when. Uh, um, uh, Chomsky and Scheffler and Cartwright reacted to this, but I think there's time now for a second wave. I mean, um, you ask a philosopher, uh, you ask somebody, somebody who is a philosopher of mathematics, is there a prime number uh, uh, between 10 and 20? Uh, then he answers in an unguarded moment, oh yes, quite a few. There are quite a few prime numbers. And suddenly he remembers his philosophy of mathematics and says, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, in a way there are, but there aren't really numbers. So, um, and, I mean, there's this old game, I mean, um, uh, Quine sneered at it, um, uh, this degrees of reality idea, yeah? uh, existent, uh, uh, existing yeah? in a, said in a normal tone of voice and existing and shouting at people, yeah? really existing. Yeah? I think something like that is needed, actually, if one wants to, to understand this. I mean, there are ever so many uses of there is which look like ordinary language counterparts. Right? Uh, to a quinianly understood existential quantifier, but they, are, they aren't. I mean, uh, they are three feet in a yard. I mean, uh, if I say that, uh, and I believe it's true, yeah? mm -hmm. and it has the shape of so, for some x blah blah blah, am I committed to feet in a yard? Um, and so on and, and, and so forth. So, I mean, this is just opening new vistas. I, I, I think. Um, that uh, whether really every so-called, uh, let's be neutral and call the quantifier a particular quantifier, yeah? and, it's, and say it's one which is to, it is one which is to Quine's liking, yeah? not quantification into any other position but singular term position. Uh, if we, let me call the animal a particular quantifier, then some uses of a particular quantifier might amount to making existential claims, but others just don't. And I think this is in the neighborhood of what, what you said sure, about sure. the non-Minongian reading of the first half of my goddess story, isn't it? Of course, there are yes. several possibilities. I mean, you, you could have a first-level predicate like X is real and, and then define the existential quantifier with the, the, the ontologically neutral yep. plus uh, uh, this first-level predicate. But my, my, my second comment is about the distinction between the concepts and, and properties because I, I find this distinction interesting in the case of uh, first order predicates, but I'm, I'm more skeptical about uh, the application of this distinction in the case of uh, higher order predicates. And here is my certain argument, just, just uh, once again a remark, but if you take first order quantification, I mean, the, 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 quant the quantifier is in fact, by Friedrich standards, a second order uh, concept, which takes a first, first order predicate uh, as, uh, as its objects, uh, I mean, the first order predicate falls in the, the for instance, the existential quantifier. But then when you move to higher order quantification, you have a third order concept. There exists an F such, or, for example, or you, you read it, the, the E2, um, Then this third order concept needs a second order predicate such that what is denoted by these second order predicates falls in the third order concept. But then what is this uh, second order predicate? I think it, it can only be Socrates is F. And mm -hmm. I don't see how this predicate can, can denote a property. I mean, it, it denotes a, a concept, but not a property. If, I mean, you have a realistic attitudes towards properties are something that I mean, exists independently of our conceptual capacities. I, think, I, I see that the, the distinction between concept and properties makes sense in the case of uh, X is uh, courageous. I mean, the property of, of being courageous just does exist independently of our conceptual capacities, yeah. perhaps. But I don't see how you could maintain this distinction in the case of uh, um, in the case of Second order properties. Um, yeah, I do think there is a kind of problem, but at, at first sight, I mean, there's a tension between uh, uh, terminologies here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I take uh, the thing which I, in the connoting business, as far as uh, properties are concerned, to be general terms, right? Mm -hmm. Not predicates. I mean, one of my claims was that in a natural language, we do have. Uh, 
kinds of quantification which are not at all to Quine's liking. Uh, but in one respect, he's right. If it's not quantification into a predicate position. I mean, great, we have this in Frey. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have this in ordinary language. Right? Uh, so if you now stare at the open sentence uh, after the quantifier in E2, Socrates is F, right? That's an open sentence. For East F, that's German actually. Uh, Socrates is F. Um, um, you have an open sentence, fair enough. Um, it's a, seen from a Frigian point of view, um, a predicate of higher order, no doubt. But it's anything but it's, it's, it doesn't remotely look like a general term, right? So if you do things my way, um, this thing is not to this thing there is not to be assigned a property. But this is just a negative bit of what I uh, should say. Then I should start thinking about the problem. What's to be said if you apply my, my semantical machinery? I mean, this is a tall order minus semantical machinery. But the picture I, I've drawn up. Uh, to sentences like this, but uh, you see what I mean. I mean, it, it doesn't immediately apply to it um, because there's no general term in the offing uh, 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 of which one could reasonably say, uh, ask the question, what property does it connote? Okay. Notwithstanding the fact that it denotes a Frigian concepts. Uh, but I was, in, I mean, one of the reasons uh, which I didn't go into in this uh, already overlong paper for uh, not assimilating the relation between um, the man Socrates and his name to the relation between the general term courageous and the property, uh, one of my reasons is that if you do that, as Frege does, one of the messes you get into is the infamous paradox of the concept of a horse, uh, right? Um, and I don't want to get into it. I mean, this is a way of avoiding this, which is rather similar to Crispin Wright's uh, proposal in this, in this area, but be that as it may. I mean, just to show a bit of my motivation. Uh, so this is as unfreedian as can be. Yeah? Yeah. So very briefly, uh, it's a pattern that takes a question. If you take God, if you take, sorry, God, your definition of God, the, yeah, the, yeah. the distinction between concepts. So uh, I assume that prior to the discovery of the molecular structure of water. Um, uh, people on Earth and Twitter must have had the same concept expressed by water, on your view, right? Is it, since, it, since the concept F is identical to the concept G, if and only if nobody can think of an object that's F, that's water, that's water, without thinking of that ob object that is G and vice versa, before the molecular structure of the difference between water and water, water on Earth and water on Earth was discovered, uh, people had the same concept on, on Earth, the same concept yeah. on Earth and Earth. Is that right? So um, your substitution instances for F and, and G and are water, water and water. Yes. I mean, you, well, you, we need... They, 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 they're, they're using the same... The same they're using the same, same word. So, so, so water in so their jargon and, and, and water in our jargon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah when we could not make any distinction between uh, water and water with an H2 and XYZ, speakers on Earth and Earth express the same concept with the word water, right? However, I mean, the intuition is that it, 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 but, but, that, 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 that same concept did not determine the same property in the, in the sense that... Yep. Oh, so, so how would you... How, what's your reaction to that typical twin and twin Mm -hmm. case. I mean, do you want to? So, how, what what strength do you want to to, to, to assign to determine in in your uh, relation between concept and property? How strongly do concepts determine properties? If uh, so, how do you generally react to that kind of, of externalist worry about your, mm -hmm. your 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 relationship between concepts and properties when when the concept is a natural time concept and when it, as opposed to say. When, 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 in fact, uh, there's a difference between, say, the appearance of a, of a, of a kind and its, 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 its uh, deep structure, its structure. How, how, what's your view about that? I have no, actually no strong view about it. I mean, um, I see why you impute this, this, this vision to me. I mean, um, uh, water in their jargon, water in our jargon is, as it were, associated with the same kind of stereotype. Yeah, right. 
Um, uh, so that is looks like a good reason for saying uh, they express uh, when mumbling water the same uh, concept as we do, and then one has these Parnamian intuitions, but nevertheless, uh, water in their mouth and water in our mouth does not determine the same property. Um, so for the first time, I must admit, I noticed that there's a tension between this intuition and my claim that um, every consent, if expressed by a non well, I just wanted to say if expressed by a non-equivocal term, but that's redundant. Every uh, concept uh, determines uh, at most one property. Then I went on and, and said, uh, but uh, some of them don't determine any property. This at most one uh, comes into pressure when one thinks of uh, the Putnam kind of, of cases. Perhaps you can deny that they express the concept. Perhaps you have yeah. any way yeah. to say something. Then you have to go it externalist in, in, in this you have, in your theory of concepts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a worked out theory of concepts. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. just yeah. to track our yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the problem with index in the case of index, you can do here what you would do for index equals wherever you would yeah. and apply the story here as not done with others. So you can yeah. say that relative to yeah, you may have a certain index equal concept and the same index equal concept would determine one thing or another depending on the yeah. context. So you may say the same thing here. So if you take the concept to be the sense expressed, then you would say there are different concepts. Yeah. That's actually my intuition. I mean, the idea would be that we assimilate it to cases like the predicate uh, foreigner, right? Uh, uh, which is indexical without being quite explicitly so, um, as the Turks in Germany um, come to realize again and again. Um, so you um, apply the strategy to the water case, or try at least. Thank you very much.